Well, thanks for coming, you know, this is great. Now, the joy of 17 tracks. And I think I'm preaching to the converted here, so is it, you know, it's, it's, but maybe there's someone who can watch it online and enjoy, you know, something later. Yeah, so how do we build an economic, sustainable, free software business? I don't know, you know? That's, uh, that works with its community. This is the, the, the uh, challenge. And uh, the punchline is it's hard. I was hoping to have people here to tell me how to do it, frankly. And, uh, you know, there we are. And I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all, easy, easy-to-do-it thing. But I just want to unpack that a little bit. So there's a heresy in, in the first thing. This, this economically sustainable thing um, suggests that someone needs to pay something for something. Scarce, right? Uh, so, so, yes, what, what could that thing be? And um, why is it a heresy? Well, it turns out there's a whole load of awesome volunteers in our project, as you know, and you, you probably meet them. And uh, they do just amazing things, and they're extremely generous. And uh, yeah, they do, they do really, really profound stuff in, in the project. And so I don't want to say anything that, uh, you know, sort of undercuts their, their great contribution. Um, but if Floss is all written by volunteers, perhaps no one needs to pay anything. Maybe there isn't a problem here. Maybe we don't need to be economically sustainable. And OpenSSL was essentially this for a very long time. And it was still an amazing piece of software, even if it had the most amazing security flaws in it as well that uh, started coming out. Uh, you know, people strained and did lots of good things uh, and, and so on. But lots of businesses basically want to fund their programming addiction, you know, accelerate the growth and evolution of the product. And so to do that, you need something economically sustainable. So again, someone needs to pay for something. Um, so, so what is uh, that something? And so there's several scarcities that uh, people might want to pay for. And here, the, here are some of them. So consultancy is a scarcity of skill problem. So if you, if you have the skills to do the work and the, and the people, uh, then you would do it yourself, right? Like, I mean, why hire someone else, you know? So, uh, so consultancy is great, but it's a great business model. And Cygnus does that. Uh, it did that back in the day. Very successful open source consultancy. And Calabra uh, as well, the parent company, uh, does that. Uh, Allotropia, of course, you know, and, uh, and various others. And it's the easiest, I would argue, most compatible floss model. It's a really a, a simple a simple model to use. And you know, you can represent your customer's interest in the project and, and you get a nice spec and hopefully you can deliver it and it's all very, very rewarding. And that's great. Uh, the skills, of course, are uh, initially scarce, but as this business grows, you find they become more abundant. Um, and th the problem is really maintenance. So you know, it's very relatively easy to sell a consulting project. It's very hard then to pay for all of the follow-on bugs that, that happen within the next three months. Never mind the you know ten year horizon of making sure it really continues to work and intersects with all the other problems. So yeah, so the maintenance piece is basically an unsolved problem. So I would argue that Floss consultancies, and I speak as one uh, myself, have often created amazing features that they then dumped on the community and then not maintained, and this is tragic. Um, second problem is that it's really hard to scale that. So it's extremely risky running a, a consultancy, um, particularly if you're being forced to tender and it's fixed price projects. There's you know, it's, it's really not easy to deliver fixed price projects in, in size and budget. Perhaps more compelling uh, as an argument against it is that the, the very best consultants eat their own market as they work. So, so these people, they do a fantastic job and then there's no more job to do. So the worst consultancies have lots of repeat customers because they never quite finish the problem or they create another problem as they're, as they're doing it. Um, but yeah, so, so this is not great. And of course, from a budgeting perspective, renewal is not automatic. Like the first thing to be cut is the consultancy budget you don't need, whereas subscriptions, for example, typically be budgeted in, in the, 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 the beta budget, uh, whereas the consultancy tends not to be. So you have to continually sell. And then, of course, this idea that the skills are going to be scarce on the long term is, is not obvious. So possibly the more you invest in your consultancy, the more popular the open source thing becomes, the more likely there are to be more entrants and the price to drop and, 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 and. Of course, this is true of many things, but uh, there's, there's plenty of smart people offshore. So then, I mean, there are about 15 of these. I, I, I'm not going to explain them all. Uh, I'm just going to go through a few. Scarcity of binaries is, is one that's uh, quite popular. So Red Hat's enterprise Linux distro is this. You can't get the binaries. Uh, you can get the source, uh, maybe, and now only if you're a customer and only if you don't share it with other people. Um, so, but you know, either way, Rel and, and Sousa pioneered this, and, and they produced this combination of you know, floss and ed editorial fitting together of things. And yeah, you basically have a paywall for, for, for content, for old content, for the, for the stable enterprise things. And obviously, with the latest and greatest is all free. Fedora, you can come in and test and, and play, play around with the more development-y, exciting uh, versions. And 
yes, you know, it's like subscribing to a newspaper, essentially, something like that. Um, and really, the pro is this annually recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue, which is really the holy grail, you know, that funds your, it's the baseline to build your business on. Now, the con is, well, there's all sorts of cons. I mean, cloning and open source is rampant. Uh, CentOS, Oracle, Unbreakable Linux, you know, all of these sort of things. And, uh, yeah, you know, people taking the source and doing that, so the source is now hidden. And, well, but, but I can tell you, and I remember very well, well when RHEL came out as this closed binaries, um, when Red Hat Linux had always been open beforehand, there was a massive outrage. And I suspect this becomes normalized in a similar way that uh, this, this business model will become normalized over time. So let's see, see what happens. The proprietary periphery, which is also known as open core. Um, but let's focus on the bad bit, you know. So uh, there you are. Um, so I've tried this a lot. Uh, so we had a thing called Evolution Exchange. And I guess you then, the problem is that the economics is then focused on the proprietary piece because that's the bit your competitors can't compete with. And yeah, so, so lots of people then, you know, grow the open core. But yeah, so, so balancing the proprietary bit around the edge is, is difficult and often Competitors will then focus on duplicating just the proprietary piece. Uh, it's a very simple value prop. Selling this to people is like if you don't pay, you don't get the software. Very easy. A bit similar to the sort of proprietary binaries. Um, so yes, and then, well, you know, uh, you can do good, great brand sharing with this. Lots of open source projects do this that are run by companies. And then the Floss community is some kind of advertising lead gen. But in order to do this, open core stuff, typically you have a, a copyright assignment, which is, can be problematic. And yeah, yeah, it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a downer in in, in several other ways uh, that, that you can imagine. Of course, the LibreOffice side has this abundance thing, you know, the uh, donation funded development uh, and the Sagrada Familia model. You know, if you've half built a cathedral, uh, you can perhaps build the other half by just selling tickets to people to come and see you finish it. You know, and it's 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 possible. Problem is, you need to uh, you know a big brand, significant project already, uh, in order to uh, actually invest in it. And it's, it's great, you know, free money to invest and, you know, all of that good stuff. Um, so obviously this is the TDF picture. Um, there are some cons to it. Uh, there's quite a number of people that feel they have to donate in order to download. So this, there's actually quite a confusion uh, element to this. They think they're buying a product and they're then disappointed and tell you I've paid and now I, I still can't download sort of thing. That's a normal, normal TDF feedback. And then, of course, in a large community, who do you employ? Who has the privilege of getting free money from the, you know, the model? Uh, come to just them. And then the conversion rates are really low. They're about a fifth or below a fifth of the yield of convenience sales. So uh, another scarcity is convenience. Like I've got an app store, I want to install it, but now I have to pay. And so the, uh, this is done by TDF. It's also done by uh, Critter, Je Compris, various other things. It used to be the case that Windows binaries would be scarce, you know, so you'd tax the Windows people and the, the Linux people got it for free as part of their distro. And this is quite a nice model. Um, and it's a very simple route to market. Um, and, and that's great. The problem is differentiation. Anyone can recompile and ship your thing. And you really badly need a known brand that people then go look for. I tried to make my uh, very ridiculous graph last year much more comprehensible. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and, and in terms of the conversion, conversion things, this is just sort of some numbers around what we get donation-wise. So TDF gets donations of something like 480 bucks for 12,000 uh, downloads a month. It's like four cents a download, something like that. Um, and you can actually, if you're charging $3 for the convenience of using the App Store, you can massively up that, that yield with almost no, no difference and potentially still get a whole lot of donations from the people you say, hey, if you don't want to use the convenience, download it over there. So this is kind of a win-win <clears throat> here. And you can see some funny things around pricing. Like, you know, you jack up the pricing, you get more, <laughs> more of this and more of this. It's, it's somewhat non-intuitive. Um, so yeah, so that's much, much more effective asking people to pay, uh, pay for things. So I think I talked a bit about this in my keynote, but uh, this is what Bob Young says in, in uh, How Do You Make Money in Free Software? He, he's written a book about it. And you know, he sold Red Hat for 34 billion, something like that, so you know, it was to IBM, right? But either way. No one expects it to be easy to make money in free software. Well, that's, that's good, isn't it? But actually he says, you know, basically you need to do the same things. You know, build a great product, market it well, look after your customers, build a great brand that stands for quality and, and customer service. And so we see in TDF, over time, ooh, well, that is interesting. I had a LibreOffice from Calabria a picture here earlier that seems to have disappeared, but never mind. I probably pressed the delete at a wrong point. Um, but I, I think in terms of brand building and building your own brand, 
Um, there's some really good things here. So New Office always had their own brand, of course, even though they're based more recently on LibreOffice. Uh, OX Office in Taiwan. <clears throat> there's been some quite cute sort of like SUSE LibreOffice branding uh, around the place. And of course, you know, famously, Tsib, uh, LibreOffice powered by Tsib and so on. So there have been some, there's some interesting things there around uh, you know, how you brand and how you co-brand and how that works out. Um, so how do we work? Well, under the hood, it's very, very simple. Uh, we get leads, and we have a sales funnel. And uh, there's basically no rocket science in this at all. It's exactly what you would see normally in a normal business. So you know, there's a very large number uh, of, of leads come in, people hitting the website, looking at our stuff. And then that gets turned to maybe 10,000 a year male, male marketing qualified leads. How you qualify affects these numbers. So qualification is like checking whether it's a good lead. You know, is this someone that's plausibly going to buy something? Or is it a user wanting one seat you know, uh, that we can't serve and should be sent, sent to some, something else? And then we get about 1,000 a year sales qualified leads where sales think they might actually sell. And then you know, budget authority need timeline. Someone goes, bangs on the door, talks to them. And hopefully we sell something. Actually, hopefully we don't sell something. Hopefully we close the partner. So our goal is really to get more partners who then have their own sales funnel and or we can help push leads into their funnel to seed them and grow them and help their business succeed. So we're generally trying to recruit partners, not sell directly to, to customers. Problem is, this funnel, uh, the funnel velocity or sales cycle is of the order of one to two years. So in terms of um, funding and building, brand building, awareness and whatever, and, and filling this part, pipeline, it's, um, it's pretty uh, slow business. The other thing is that if you get twice as many leads in this front end, typically you get twice as many out the other end. And again, if you have half as many, well, that, that's the easy thing, right? Like potentially you could saturate the market, and, and if you double the leads, you wouldn't get any more sales, potentially. But luckily, we're not that big yet. You know, there is plenty of upside growth. So, um, but this lead flow then is basically the lifeblood of business. All of the good things that come out of, of uh, at the end of the funnel in terms of better LibreOffice, more software, more code, more patches, they all started off way over there with the, uh, the leads going in at the other end of the funnel. And so then we have marketing. We split that into some marketing and sales. And marketing is anything that's one to many. Um, so website, I mean, just there's loads of activity. They call this activity-based sales for a reason. And lots of things going on. You know, contact scoring, metrics, <clears throat> all sorts of things. Tracking where things come, what's successful, what works, what doesn't work. And, uh, you know, funding and advertising and so on. And then sales-wise, we have all the one-to-one -one activities. Someone, someone actually literally goes and interacts with those 1,000 people a year, sends them an email, reads the answer, interacts, answers their questions, nurtures them, tries to encourage them, uh, and listens to their objections and overcomes their objections. You know, maybe uh, negotiates then pricing with them, signs at our partner or you know, maybe even the customer. Uh, we then put sales engineering on it, set up and support, you know, integrate and advise. And we have uh, four people in the marketing team, something like that. And we have four people in the sales team, including two sales engineers. And it's really a huge amount of work. And almost no one ever sees it, um, even chasing the unpaid bills. You know, look at that. That's the, uh, that's the fun piece. And then, of course, there's the whole uh, back-end delivery thing. So in terms of uh, supporting LibreOffice and making a product around this, you probably need a five to 10-person team before you can start. Um, so uh, yeah. So there's a whole load of things there in terms of release engineering, you know, support front ends, level three, a code fixing, you're going to need skills in each of the components and so on. A QA, obviously, security. Uh, and then there's a whole load of other sort of managery things that you're going to need to run a business. So if you're very small, you can skip many of these things or crunch them into fewer people. And maybe you could get it down to just five, five people. But it's, it's necessary to have quite a large team. Um, so yeah, so this is partly why we, we try and enable our partners to, uh, to go to market instead of us. And so we can provide that grunt behind the scenes and then sell through them. That's the, that's the ideal. And of course, that means lots of uh, team building and uh, you know, talking to the partners and hearing what they want and uh, skydiving and uh, all, all that good stuff. And yeah, so, so we, we try and work out what they, uh, what they do and what they want done, how we can sell with them and so on. So the Document Foundation has a number of really helpful things to contribute to their mission and drive their mission, um, which help the ecosystem help them. And that's, that's really, really good and re relatively cheap to do, we hope. 
So first of all, there's a certified professional scheme, which is great. So there's a web page that says, we think these people are competent to do this job. And that's really, really useful for customers, that they make sure that they know they're getting someone actually clueful. It's really useful for businesses, to, for tendering, so that <clears throat> if people want to get someone clueful instead of the lowest price person that doesn't know and doesn't contribute to the community, they can ask for certification. And it's great to give that neutral third party stamp of approval on, on people. And it's really, well, it's easy to get certified. So you know you can pick the certification team. They will probably reach out to you as and when you've contributed enough. It's cheap, it's effective, it seems to work quite nicely. Um, there's a page on their web website called LibreOffice in Business that has a remarkably small hit count. I haven't looked up the numbers now, but I got fed up of seeing the tiny proportion of people that actually cared enough to look for LibreOffice in Business. As they went through the website, it was uh, very small. Um, there's this LibreOffice technology, Umbrella brand, which is great. So Italo has done a fantastic job making that uh, look really good. And uh, that sort of includes many of the cool things that happen around LibreOffice whilst allowing people to build their own brands. You remember my quote back in the day, the building the strong brand that stands for quality and customer service is really vital. Um, so yeah, LibreOffice technology then allows there to be a family of those and for them all to grow, we hope. And uh, then there was, of course, renaming the PC product to LibreOffice Community. Um, which was a nice try, well, worth trying, but at least had no measurable effect that we could measure. So there you are. So these are really good things. Of course, there's some other things that could be improved. So I'd argue the ecosystem needs a number of things that are perhaps not so important in a, in a volunteer community of people come and go, and you know it's all, all, all less or more transient, perhaps. So I think you know predictability and stability. Uh, you know, if there's a contract commitment, it needs to be clear that it will be honored. Uh, you know, just sort of basic rule of law stuff, honestly. Um, visibility for contribution. You know, that if, if a company does it as a big contribution, that it's, that it's visible. They can build their brand with that. That's really, really important part of it. And it may seem not important to the people making the marketing unless they, unless they know. And I, I think we're really improving there as, as TDF. But I think it's, it's still it's a good thing. And for many, many, many years, Open source businesses have marketed themselves by their transient feature edge. So the stuff that they do now, other people don't have. And I think a clearly defined domain for TDF's activities. Where is it going to go? Where is it not going to go? Uh, so you know, TDF is now selling software in the App Store, which which is which is fine. But is it going to sell things elsewhere? Who knows? You know, like uh, it would be it would be nice to have more predictability around that. And then I think I really like the, uh, the LibreOffice technology uh, branding. I think that's great. But we should have clear and helpful rules that we can uh, depend on to make sure that, that that works well. And those should drive people to contribute, the makers and not takers. It shouldn't be the case that you can just use the LibreOffice brand to drive your business if you're not going to contribute anything or you're not contributing anything. And yes, attacking lead flows is not really great. And the LibreOffice brand is quite big and powerful. And it would be good to make sure that it's, you know, it is not used in that way. And then really just you know, being more complimentary and more deliberate about the things that companies can do and that TDF can do so that we can work together in a complimentary way to do the things that we do best, that each of us does best. So oh, I just wanted to look at this because this is quite, quite an interesting one. Some people think it's just our, you know, us that has problems. But having a quick look over the fence, here's the Drawio uh, people. So Drawio, you may or may not know, is a little drawing app. And it's quite fun. And it's no longer open source. So there's a um, new clause 10 they put in their Apache license that says, none of the work may be used in any form as part or whole of an integration plugin or app that integrates with Atlassian's Confluence or Jira. So obviously, this is domain of use restriction. It's no longer open source. And why? Well, if you go and look at the ticket, which is linked uh, uh, on XPage, he says, we fund the project entirely from the sales of this Confluence integration. And he'd been ignoring other people shipping their own Drawio apps until he received this review on his app. And you can see how Drawio is presented you know, in, in the Confluence app store. You know, there's a try it for free, and then there's some pricing, and you can, you know, whatever, you can, you can play with it. And here's the one star review by Dave Kin, who I don't know who this guy is. But he says, it's free. Why does this application cost anything? Cost way too much, too much. Anyway, just install any of the free Drawio add-ons. Don't get scammed. And uh, this really got on the wick of the, the guy who was doing all the money and funding his development through effectively this this model in the in the App Store. And so he says, "Well, you know, I'm not mostly uh, over fast, but if you call me a scammer, <laughs> that's it." So he basically just re relicensed all of his app, which is a shame and a great loss for open source at at, at some point. 
And, and typically, this is done instead through branding. So uh, you know, you control your brand and stop Drawio being used as by other people that randomly compile it. So, um, but 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 interesting to see, you know, how the fragility of of lead flows and ratings and that sort of thing associated with your brand at one end of the funnel really have a huge impact on your ability to execute at the other end, uh, to the extent that people do this this sort of thing. So anyway, we make Collabor Online, and uh, yes, there we go. And that's that's pretty much it. Are there any questions or wonderful new business ideas that uh, we can use? You know, is there any, uh, or, or partners, potential partners? I think you are all potential partners in the room anyway. So look at that. Well, Gabriel, Gabriel, look at that. You know, can sell to you. you know? <laughs> anyway, that's my talk. You've been very patient. Thanks so much. Oh, and, and, and any questions or thoughts or heckling, stoning? You know, no. Torsten, what do you think? I think you should have a keynote to explain it. Oh, excellent. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So come on then, give us a vigorous, detailed disagreement, you know. <laughs> but yeah, what could we can shoot. Yeah, get through it. Yeah, sure. If I, if I totally understand that part about price, you can improve it or for nimble business. And, uh, yeah. Oh, he, he has at least five to ten people, I think, you know, Torsten, don't you? Yeah, I think, yeah. Yes. So um, it's possible you've not noticed how much work Torsten is doing in the background to run a business and, uh, you know. Uh, maybe he is, you know, yeah. Some people are insanely productive. It's possible, you know. No, you're, you're right. Fair enough. So, so I think for the business administration pieces, you're right. Uh, that, that's, that can be done. But I think in terms of supporting, you know, Calc and also Impress and also Writer and also, you know, Base and then the infrastructure underneath it and the horrifying Java bug with the interaction with whatever, like it is possible there's one person who can fix all of those issues and provide a high quality support. But I would argue it really helps to have people who are experts in each of those domains. And of course, good engineers can, can be you know, uh, trained to do other things, just how quickly they can do it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like, yeah, like I, and, and similarly, in terms of specialization, you know, like, I, I mean, we have, have Andrash who, who does many things. But just release engineering is in itself seems easy, doesn't it? You just throw it into the CI, right? And now it comes a binary, except never quite as easy as that. There's always some. Problem, failure, breakage, unit test, cock up, you know, la la la, CI, brokenness, and so on and so on. So there's a surprising amount of effort just standing still um, before you can even then, you know, uh, build out uh, bigger capability. So yes, I think almost certainly in small businesses, there are nasty non-linearities in the number of people that you have. And the bigger the business gets, the smaller those non-linearities are, if that makes sense and the more specialized individuals you can get to do specific things. And so in theory, the more efficient you are, and I, I have no other explanation for how something like IBM can possibly be efficient as a company beyond the fact that there's this incredible specialization that makes it possible to do that. that because to all intents and purposes, it looks a complete mess, right? Um, Yeah, there's more management overhead there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then trying when, when you when you get a team above ten people, uh, management becomes more and more of a thing. And uh, you know, yeah, you you you. There's only a limited number of people that one person can manage. So of course there are lots of schools of management. Like you don't need managers at all. Like Valve, for example, has no management at all, and everybody does exactly what they want to do. And maybe that works for Valve, but I think you need a pretty massive cash cow somewhere in the background to fund the fun, you know? And uh, I don't have that, which is a shame. Uh, you know, I, I wish I did. But uh, yeah, does that make sense? Good question. I mean, I love it. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Torsten? Do you have a massive cash cow in the background that can fund? No? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Normie, normie. So yeah, 
Oh well, it's all good fun, and I, and I don't think that there's a there's a magic answer really. Um, it's just hard work, and that's okay. Life has lots of hard work in it. But um, yes, I mean the thing that I really like to give give credit for is just the the uh, the people that are working hard constantly in that sales pipeline to uh, you know encourage people to buy and and get them down the down the pipeline, or you know to become partners because that's really uh, that's really hard work, and there's a lot of rejection in it too. Right, so particularly in sales. So uh, yeah, that's my presentation. Well, thanks, guys. Good to see you all. Bye.